So I don't know if we've ever had a moment where criminal justice policy has been as much at a forefront as it is now. I mean, you have the discussion about the local system and Rikers Island and stop and frisk. You have questions about abuse in state prisons. Um, and obviously you have you know, a discussion about sentencing at the federal level. The story about the DOJ releasing the 6,000 prisoners, or I guess it's supposed to happen soon, that's, that's interesting. You know where that came from? And, which we think that's going to be one of the biggest mass releases the feds have ever done. It is, but what's strange about, about that story is the way it sort of became a story and how it's been packaged and presented. It's actually not really news. It's something that we knew was going to happen for a very long time. And so my thought when I first saw that was, why is this being presented in this way? And is it sort of almost designed to elicit a, a negative response among you know from the people who actually leaked it? Um, because obviously you're going to see sort of the or I've expected to see um, the predictable sort of fear mongering about prisoners being released. You know, in reality, we actually release tens of thousands of similarly situated federal prisoners um, every year. But this is, like you say, like the biggest in one fell swoop, I guess, that we've seen. I don't know what your thoughts were, but. Well, one of the things that's interesting is that, like, it keeps getting presented as this is Obama's release. Right. right. This is not Obama's release. This is something that the U.S. Congress authorized. I mean, the United States Sentencing Commission is a bipartisan panel. Right. Because obviously reentry is something people do talk about, and, yeah. and the lack of services and the fact that we, you know, expect people to instantly acclimate themselves. But that's not a worry you have about this no. And one thing that I've been following is in, in California, I mean, dating back years now, um, you know, the state of California was ordered by the U.S. Supreme Court years back to release, you know, a significant number of prisoners because their facilities were so overcrowded right. that it was, you know, creating an unconstitutional um, crisis uh, when it came to, to, to providing health care. And so they were under, mandated to release a whole number of, pri uh, a whole lot of prisoners, basically. But when you actually look at uh, the, the population of prisoners who have been released in California for, for crimes that aren't just nonviolent drug crimes, right. um, necessarily, you know, you don't see blood running in the streets. You don't see this, like, incredible uptick in, in crime, which is what was being predicted. And so, so I think that a lot of that is just crass, fear-mongering, you mm -hmm. know, rhetoric on the part of uh, political actors. There's always absurdities in the media when it comes to criminal justice. Are there any that stick out recently in, in your mind? Well, yeah. Hmm. I mean, speaking of fear-mongering, you know, the one that I was thinking about uh, on my way here is, uh, you know, you see all of this rhetoric about the war on cops right now. And uh, Rahm Emanuel, I guess, very recently was in a meeting with um, police chiefs in which he blamed... Um, an uptick in homicides in Chicago on this idea, uh, on this war, of, uh, war on cops idea. And the idea, I, I believe he actually used the word fetal to describe the position that police now find themselves in, in which they are afraid to do their job for fear of being captured on film doing something wrong. Huh. So there's all this, you know, incredible, shameless fear mongering around the, the idea that we shouldn't be, that this recording of police and catching police officers, you know, brutalizing or shooting, you know, people in communities of color is actually creating a negative effect on cops and, and um, making them literally afraid to do their jobs. Uh, so you see that from a lot of different politicians, but Rahm Emanuel is the most recent. I mean, I find the fetal position very comfortable, <laughs> and I use it at work all the time. But how about you? Anything stand out recently? You know, none of this stuff is funny. I don't know about you, but this is the grimmest stuff I've ever yeah. covered. The last couple of years I spent doing nothing but prison. But there's a story I saw on the Marshall Project has this wonderful news ticker. You know, they send out this sort of collection of stuff. And they, from the Miami Herald, I think, about this kid who was 16 years old at a Florida juvenile detention facility who was bribed with snicker bars and honey buns to beat up other kids. It was like a fight club. It's like mm -hmm. a gladiator. We had the same thing at Rikers right. at the, that The Voice wrote about. This kid gets out. He's on the street. And he runs into somebody that he'd been paid to knock around when he was inside. And the kid pulled out a gun and killed him. 
Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just, you know, you talk about the unintended consequences of incarceration, the mm -hmm. kind of things that come along with the territory. 16 years old. No, ain't nothing funny about it. Yeah, sure. that is not funny. You've covered a lot of different stories in your time. Is, are there particular challenges other than just the grimness to covering stories about what goes on yeah, inside? Yeah, it's all secret. In New York state law, everything that a correction officer does on the job is a secret under law. Section 50A of the New York State Civil Rights Law, believe it or not, mm -hmm. keeps every bit of a personnel record secret. So if you do something bad, even if you're cited for it, you're disciplined for it, it's a secret. You can't find out about it. And the only way I've been able to dig stuff out is that sometimes they go into court to try to force the state to live up to some order that has gotten from an arbitrator to pay up his back pay or something. And then I get the arbitrator's decision. And then I get some of the backup material. But other than that, this is like a crisis that's been playing out every single day for years behind bars and is completely out of sight and out of mind. Yeah, the transparency issues are like one of the things that I think if you haven't done uh, a prison story, even other reporters don't understand just how, I mean, it's a secure system. There's a certain logic to it, but you know, I remember once we did a story about Bedford Hills and I sent a photographer up to take a picture of the prison from the road and he got picked up by the local police and we had to have a ridiculous dispute about who the road belonged to. Right. Um, but you've encountered that as well. The transparency stuff is, is really sort of all-encompassing. Yeah, I think it's inevitable. I think it's also so arbitrary, you know, depending on who the warden is at what given facility, within what state, you know, you either have access or you don't. Uh, but one thing along the same lines that has uh, less to do with access to facilities and more just to do with access to information uh, is, you know, I've done a lot of reporting over the years on, um, again, on executions and sort of specifically on lethal injection and all these uh, controversies uh, and sort of perverse uh, formulas we've come up with, you know, to try to kill prisoners. And what states have done actually uh, in recent years is basically pass laws making it an official state secret to know uh, what drugs, uh, where they're uh, obtaining the drugs they use mm -hmm. to kill prisoners. And this has become a very contentious legal issue. And I was recently in Oklahoma covering an execution that did not go forward in the end. Uh, but part of the challenge there was that uh, there was all, the, all these questions came up afterwards. They had the wrong drug at the last moment mm -hmm. and they realized this right before this execution was going to go forward. How did this happen? We have no idea because we're not allowed to know who mm -hmm. the provider of this drug is to the state. And so it, it presents all of these incredibly perverse challenges uh, and, and the fact that these laws continue to be passed right now is really alarming. Mm -hmm. Did any of this stuff come up during the, the Attica story you did earlier this year? Um, I imagine you encountered some of these issues, some of these obstacles. Uh, how did that story, how did that come out of your plate and, you know, talk well, about Well, in, in that case, there was actually a criminal charge that had been brought against three guards at Attica for beating this 29-year-old inmate. I mean, they had broken two of his legs, his collarbone, his right orbital socket, and almost killed him. And they had ultimately been charged criminally for that. So, you know, you're charged in criminal, they can't make that a secret. At least they haven't figured out a way to do it yet. So there was a uh, public record of some of the uh, underlying documents that I was able to get that at least say, okay, this is what they say happened. And working backwards from there, but, you know, in terms of getting the actual internal discipline. I said, well, okay, so were these guys bad apples? Like, were they a problem for a long time? And I thought that was a perfectly reasonable question to ask the New York's Department of Corrections. They said, well, we can't tell you. Mm -hmm. said, well, what do you mean you can't tell me? You, these guys are under criminal indictment for beating someone in your facility. Right. Uh, we, we, that would be a violation of 50A. Has there been a lot of absurdity in the Glossop story? And have you been following that? There's been a, a tremendous amount of uh, absurdity. Can you give, us, give us the background of that. I haven't followed it that closely. So, so what's interesting about the, the, the case of Richard Glossip is that uh, I had to sort of learn about it very quickly, actually. The name Richard Glossip, to me, uh, he was the lead plaintiff in the Supreme Court's um, case, uh, Glossip versus Gross, which had to do with, again, this, this lethal injection question. Um, Oklahoma had adopted um, the use of this drug, midazolam, to, to execute uh, prisoners, and Richard Glossop was among a number of, of prisoners who were challenging it. Basically, Richard Glossop was managing a 
kind of crappy motel in Oklahoma City. His boss at the time was murdered in a very grisly way. Um, the person who committed that murder, who admitted to committing this murder, was this 19-year-old kid named Justin Sneed who worked under Richard Glossop. Justin Sneed confessed, basically, to having uh, uh, murdered his boss, uh, but implicated Richard Glossop in exchange for a plea deal in which he avoided the death penalty. So the guy who kills the man uh, gets a life without parole sentence. Richard Glossop, who was um, accused of having masterminded the crime um, for reasons that were not really entirely clear, gets sent to death row. Um, no one had ever really written a definitive sort of look at the case, and this guy's been on death row for decades now, or almost 20 years. Um, and so he was approaching execution. He's part of this kind of litigation around the lethal injection protocol, but at the same time, he insists that he's an innocent man. He's come very close to execution now a number of times. Um, and by the time I finally went down to Oklahoma uh, to, to cover uh, what we thought was going to be his final execution date, uh, things took a very strange turn, which is that at the 11th hour, I was outside the prison accompanied by his family members. Actually, we all thought he had been denied a, a stay by the Supreme Court. We thought this execution was going to go forward. Um, and suddenly we hear word that uh, the governor, of all people who had uh, repeatedly denied any clemency you know, uh, for him, had halted the execution because they discovered that they had the wrong drugs in the prison and she was notified of this. What you need to understand about Oklahoma is that they, they were at the center of this like incredible national scrutiny around their ex uh, execution mm -hmm. protocol. You would think that the first yeah, case sure. to go forward to get to the point of execution, they would Have really their cover their bases, row. really yeah. be prepared. And in fact, the opposite was true. Everything we've learned since is that not only did they have the wrong drug, um, the, pr the the, the last execution before Richard Glossop was set to die was also carried out using a drug that was nowhere to be found in the official state protocol. Um, so it's just a complete chaos. And what has happened since then is that Oklahoma has halted all pending executions um, indefinitely until they resolve this. What stuff. was that like to be with his family when they thought that his death was like minutes away? It was quite gut wrenching. And I have to say that that's one thing that I think we need more of in journalism is, you know, I was there with a colleague and my colleague was inside the prison and had put her name in the lottery for sort of um, to witness the execution. Oh, wow. um, but because there were two of us, I, I decided to stay outside uh, where there were very few reporters by comparison. Um, but the people who were outside the prison were about more than a dozen family members, uh, some of whom were as young as 12, uh, mm. people who are loved ones of this man who'd been condemned to die. And I'll never forget when they received word that the Supreme Court had denied them and they believed their loved one was going to be killed. Uh, it was this really crushing um, moment where you see in, a, in very stark humanizing terms, you know, the collateral damage, if you want to call it that, of the death penalty. We talk about victims and victims' families, but we don't ever think about the families of the condemned as being the victims themselves. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just that the state lays claim to the power to execute somebody in the name of justice. But all of these people were essentially anguished and um, traumatized. Uh, you know, both when they thought there, if that Richard Glossop was going to die, and then afterwards when he received yet another stay, and that kind of crazy roller coaster they went through. So it must be. Yeah. You can't make this stuff up. No. I mean, that's just astonishing. Yeah. Right. I mean, they have the, the entire attention of the nation on them about this institution, about the start, and they don't even really know how they're going to do it. Yeah. yeah. They're making it up as they go along. Is basically right. what's been so clear. So race is an inescapable part of this conversation. I mean, you have a country where 30% of the people are people of color and a prison system, a correction system, where it's 60%. And pretty much everyone knows that and has known it for a long time, so much so that I don't think we've really looked closely recently at exactly why that is. You know, what leads to that being the case? You know, what do you think about that? Look, I, I, we, Thank goodness, I think, this country and the media are sort of going through a look back at 20 years of really misguided, screwed up criminal justice policies that allowed this disproportionate impact to happen on poor people, most of whom were black and brown. The great thing about the book by Michelle Alexander, The New Jim Crow, 
isn't so much that she breaks new ground, it's that she pulls together mm -hmm. like all the different stories that had appeared in all the newspapers you know, over the last 20 years, all the different uh, sociological studies that had been done, and puts them in one place and said, guess what, you know? When we said we were gonna crack down on drugs, a war on drugs, they only went to the easiest, low-hanging low fruit. Mm -hmm. They went to the ghettos and they got as many people as they could, and then they got paid by the federal government to do more of it. You know, I mean, that's really the sad truth of it. The, at the end of the day, the reason why we had the incredible disparity between crack cocaine and powder cocaine, which everybody knew that white people were more li likely to abuse powder cocaine and crack cocaine, was simply because of the role that our business, the media, played in, like, hyping up as much as you could. Crack babies, mm -hmm. you know, crack mamas, you know. We did so much. I was in the Daily News when we were doing this stuff, you know. In retrospect, it's a journalism felony. You know, we never looked at the other side. We probably had people who were going into the newsroom, I'm sure we did in the bathroom, to do a couple of lines of coke. We didn't think about them in the same vein as that. So race has certainly been at the forefront of the local conversation about criminal justice, whether it's stop and frisk or, you know, what's going on in, in the city's jails. And as you mentioned earlier, those are a separate system policed by a separate uh, force of correction officers. Uh, the conversation about Rikers and conditions there mm -hmm. Is that similar to, I mean, does that parallel the concerns we have about the state system in terms of abuse of inmates, discipline of the correction officers, or is that different because it's a more transient population? You know, I've asked almost every, I've talked to a lot of inmates over the last couple of years, and I always like, so where's the, where's the worst place you ever were? No one has ever said Rikers, and they all go, I mean, from the city, they pass through Rikers. Right, right they detain everybody. their pretrial. You know, and, so, yeah. There's some tough stuff. We, we, we've seen some incredible incidents of brutality. But yeah, number one, you're only in jail if your sentence is less than a year, number one, or if you're held there pending trial, which can be a long time, as we know. Uh, stories that you've written about, you know, I didn't an item about people who are held for, for years. But at the same time, the, there's a couple of different disparities. I mean, one is, and this is something to wrestle with, the color of the police force, and that's what everybody behind bars calls mm -hmm. them, the police. You know, they don't, they don't usually don't say COs or anything. They're the police, right, you know, right. I say, which police are we talking about here? They're talking about the guards. In New York City, uh, the majority of the guards are, are black or Puerto Rican, you know, mm -hmm. or Latino. We, we have like a much higher percentage, as opposed to upstate, where it's a virtual, you know, white workforce. It's very rare in a place like Attica. There's maybe 600 guards and like six of them are not white. I think that the experience of being behind bars is numbing to everybody, mm -hmm. both the people who are there doing the work and the people who are behind bars. Everybody does time. And one of the things that inmates say to me over and over again is like, you know, we don't think that all the guards here are lousy. But the problem is, is that the few who are cast such a spell over the rest that nobody dares do the right thing because they get called inmate lovers. One thing that's been positive is that the state's prison population in New York, and I don't know if this, you would probably know better than I if it's true mm -hmm. nationwide, is it's, it's dropped pretty significantly over the past 10 years. Yeah, you know, from, from 70 plus to 50. To, to 50. Yeah. And so one argument is that the people who remain are you know, the harder cases, mm -hmm. people more likely to have mental illness, more likely to be there for a violent offense. And so that has upped the temperature. The most of the low-level drug stuff is gone. Most right. of the people are changing the Rockefeller drug laws, those people are gone for the most. Not everybody, but a lot of them. So do you think that's part of, you know, the, the, uh, the patterns of abuse we're seeing in the it's state? It's part of what and, feeds it. Right. But like, you know, she's talking about somebody who's been locked up since he was 17 years old. He's now, what, 69, you said? Mm -hmm. You know, I mean... Every single study that's done shows that, you know, the rate of, of both violations behind bars and after you're out of bars, once you hit the plateau, you stop doing crimes, you know, you just, it's, it ends, you know. One of the strongest arguments being made is that the aging prison population, at least in New York State, is going to soon be costing us over $150,000 a year mm -hmm. to keep people who everybody agrees are not a threat. And when it comes to people who are 
behind bars already, you know, our, our clemency, our avenues for clemency are so limited, you know, and it's so political and parole boards are stacked with political appointees and you can just look at state after state after state where the, the people who should be the poster children for, for re rehabilitation mm -hmm. are just routinely denied as a matter of course, um, any, any, any kind of, and, and you see this, I mean, not to constantly go back to the harshest penalties, but you see this with, with uh, the death penalty. I mean, literally, I was on my way to Oklahoma passing through Atlanta the day that Kelly Gissendanner, this woman in Georgia, was set to be executed. She had already come very close to execution um, once before. And this is a woman who had no innocence claim, but was convicted for a very similar crime as Richard Glossop, which was that um, she had arranged with her then boyfriend to murder her, her husband at the time. And the boyfriend carried out the crime. Uh, he then testified against her. She got the death penalty. He got life without parole. Kelly Gissendanner, this was many years ago, but since then, she was the only woman on George's death row, became, you know, a theologian and, and, and got to know all of these women who were incarcerated who looked up to her over the years and who took great comfort in you know, her as, as a mentor. And she, she had this uh, clearly very positive um, effect on, on some of the women behind bars who she got to know. And when it came time for her execution, there were so many people who wanted her to live because of, she, she was playing a more positive than negative role within this strange world of, of, of prison. But the clemency board, you know, denied her and she was executed the day before uh, Richard Glossop was to be executed. So if we can't provide meaningful um, opportunities for people to sort of for, for redemption, if we still believe in that, you know, to somebody like that, it's very hard to imagine that we're going to go very far in any fundamental way um, in rethinking um, sort of punitiveness and the way we, we, we imprison people. One thing that bothers me about the conversation now, which is promising in some ways, you know, the fact that people are talking about reform, whether you're Rand Paul or Bernie Sanders and everyone in between is talking about it, is that you get the feeling that we kind of we want our we want to have our cake and eat it too. You know, we think that we can have a system that imprisons tens of thousands of people, but that it can be, you know, fair and I don't know if you can have a prison where there isn't some abuse, just given the I environment really you talk create. About it. You think they talk about it as being fair? I think they just turn their eyes away from it. I, I just think it's been an unexamined, it's, it's been an open wound that no one wanted to look at yeah. for But years. now they're looking at it, right? Yeah. And now, we, so now we're talking about it, the city, Rikers, that we're going to make Rikers a place right. where this sort of thing isn't going to happen anymore. Right. And I don't know if that's possible. I don't know if you can have a system where you have mm. you know, guards who have all the power and, and totally disempowered people, some of whom are guilty of violent crimes and some who aren't, altogether and not have. I don't know if that's possible. And, and that's what's always bothered me about the death penalty conversation is that when we focus on you know, the kinds of drugs we use or particular cases like the theologian woman mm. who present a very good face, you could solve those problems and we'd still have a death penalty which is you know, immoral on its face. And that's something that the, the anti-death penalty movement has grappled with. You know, what do you feel about that? Do you feel that we can, is there a danger that we will fix the death penalty but still have a death penalty? I don't think the death penalty is fixable. I, you know, I'm very, I, I, I don't think that that's a system worth fixing or that can be fixed. Uh, even if you're just talking about innocence alone, we've exonerated what, like 156 people and that doesn't even capture the innocents that have ended up on death row. So, so even uh, on that very narrow question uh, to say, you know, nothing about everything else, I don't, I don't think it's fixable. Um, but do you think people can be deluded to thinking that it's fixable? Well, that's, that's the delusion we're operating under now. You know, this idea that we can just, if we just choose the right drug, and they're, we're becoming more and more absurd in the drugs that we're adopting, and just, it's, it's literally human experimentation. Yeah. But again, I, I think that, you know, the fixes we're looking at, a lot of states that have abolished the death penalty in recent years have replaced it with life without parole. And there's a way in which life without parole presents a whole new set of really uh, big problems, which is that there's no urgency of a looming execution. So actually, those cases don't get reviewed as, as thoroughly right. as as, uh, as death penalty cases, and yet they are still um, vulnerable to the same problems that we see in, in you know wrongful convictions or, or otherwise you know bad convictions in the death penalty again and again and again. So and is is yeah. lethal injection the only method? used now or do, do some states still do the, the chair or the other? Well what's so interesting ways? is that because lethal injection has come under uh, fire in so many different ways and states are, have been scrambling to obtain the right drugs, there are states, Tennessee actually where I recently relocated, I'm actually now living in Nashville for the most part, um, in Tennessee they recently passed legislation to bring back the electric chair uh, as a sort of backup method of execution because uh, the administration there wants to start executing people again. and. Um, 
and and in other states it's actually the firing squad. And and Utah has the firing squad. Right, exactly. And and actually Oklahoma, uh, where I recently was, um, has moved to to start using nitrogen gas to to uh, carry out, which I actually think in terms of um, public perception and sort of our appetite for these punishments. Right in a sort of perverse way is a good thing because it really forces us to confront what we're talking about and it's not this kind of sanitized medical, medical procedure, yeah, right, procedure right. which is bankrupt on its face. It's actually, you know, murdering other human beings. Where will we go next? You know, there, there have been a lot of articles this summer about this emerging bipartisan right. consensus on criminal justice reform that, you know, conservatives who are concerned about Fiscal impact and liberals who are concerned about the human impact are all against, you know, these sentences for nonviolent offenders. Um, do you have a sense of, of like how far that bipartisan consensus goes, and and how much hope should we have for that? I mean, is it likely that you know come this time next year or five years from now we'll have a much more humane system, or is this just a well, kind it is of an amazing thing? I mean, just right. I mean, not for nothing, but like. The fact is that, like, at both the Republican and the Democratic debates, we got presidential candidates who are talking about this stuff, yeah. which, to me, is an astonishing fact yeah. because it just never ever showed up before in a national presidential election. I don't think it was there in 08 when, when a black guy was running for president. I don't think we talked one word about it, you know, or, or really in 2012 either. So now we've got like it's on the table, right? The, how far can they go? You know, I, I think that that's, that's a question. Obviously, some of it is being driven by finances, right? You know, we got too many people, we can't afford it. That's how Texas got on board, basically, mm -hmm. was they said, like, oh, we can't keep doing this nonsense. We can't afford to pay for it. But we have a narrow window. That's my feeling, is that, like, we're here for as long as crime doesn't soar. When crime starts soaring again, mm -hmm. you're going to have a public reaction, which is going to make all these, you know, sort of... Uh, now sort of friendly to the idea of reform, Republicans and Democrats, they're going to change their mind on this stuff and they're going to go right back to their bad old ways. So you got to get as much done right now as you can because it ain't going to last. It is pretty grim, uh, this beat, and you know, it's personal tragedies wherever you look, victims and witnesses and the people who are actually behind bars. Uh, and their family members on all sides. So given that, what, I mean, how do you keep covering it? What, what sort of drives you? What makes it rewarding for you? Well, for me, I think it, it's always been the people uh, who I've met along the way. From the very beginning, what sort of radicalized me around criminal justice issues was meeting people who had experienced it firsthand and the incredible uh, courage and tenacity they showed. And I remember for me, I felt like if, they in their unbelievable uh, position of trauma and injustice, if they could sort of survive that and, and tell their story, then who are we to not also, you know, take these stories and try to push them out and, and, and try to, you know, push for something better. And so that continues to kind of drive drive me, but I haven't been doing this as long as you have, so maybe you have something else. I don't know else. about that. I mean, I, I agree absolutely. It is the people. You know, I mean, it's, look, sometimes I wish I'd never gotten into this stuff because it won't let go of you, you know, like you meet somebody in, in prison and you're kind of married to them for a long time because they're there and if you've shown them the simple, you know, any kind of attention or kindness, they're going to start writing you. And they're going to call you mm -hmm. and you're going to have to respond to some stuff. So I get a lot of letters now. I try to respond to all of them with whatever I can get back. But, yeah, you know, you can't just leave people behind. I mean, I... I think that there's more great stories in every prison visiting room that I've been in than I see in most magazines, you know, that like come out and that pretend to cover what, what's going on in the human condition. You know, I mean, remarkable people. You know, the waste of human talent is the thing that really drives you nuts. You know, you're just sitting with some guy who's doing 25 to life, you know, and you realize he's much smarter than I am, you know, and, and he's like not only mastered the law and he knows his own case, but like he knows exactly what's going on in this facility and how many guards there are. And like, you know, I'm thinking, Jesus Christ, this guy could be running, you know, General Motors or something. What's he doing sitting here? Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, you get stuck. But I, listen, we're reporters, you know, we're looking to do stories that are meaningful. And like, I think that there is this window in which maybe we can like shed light on something and maybe hopefully get some change going. So, you know, you keep, you keep plowing away, but Jesus, it is grim stuff. You know, I mean, it breaks your heart every time, you, you know, I think about people that I've met that are just sitting there behind bars. It breaks your heart every day. <laughs>